the pirates. There was a pause even as the Nagasha beheld that Franklin was suddenly equal to her. He casually brushes his left shoulder with his right hand before brutally uppercutting her with his left. The Nagasha reels and then snaps back with a huge bombardment of screaming electrical power that Franklin rips into his right hand and compresses into a blade to turn it back on her. As this happens, Miles braces himself and moves to try and catch as the rest of the team is suddenly zooming in, far too fast and far too clearly for anything to be real. Is everyone all right? The hell is going on? Miles demands as he does indeed have to catch a few of them, and they sort of chain together by grabbing each other and zoom down. Gravity, friction, and inertia seem to be more suggestions than physics. Reality is off its meds, or it's been issued the good stuff, Jake remarks smartly, even as Marcus points at nothing less than a paper letter and catches it easily. Marcus turns it over, and it unfolds into a large piece of paper. He scans it and then passes it to Miles. In the background, Franklin catches an enormous fireball that is simultaneously all the spite that could ever be and drips with acidic contempt for others even as it pushes him back and seems to grind against his hand and shred its own mass against his sheer will. Everything is now within the axiom and within this contained area, all that matters is will. I can't use null. I don't know what will happen. We're in and part of the axiom now. Find the heart of this madness and stop it so that I can start using a proper trump card. I'll keep her as busy as possible. Miles reads out loud and everyone turns to look as the acidic fireball of spite is crushed in one hand despite being a hundred times Franklin's size and it seems to initiate a big bang. All in favor of sobering up reality? Aye. The rest of the men state at once, even as they watch Franklin grab a forming galaxy and turns it into a throwing star that replicates itself into a wall of spinning galaxies that homes in on and cascades into the Nagasha. She in turn charges at him with a psychotic fury and lunges at him with what seems to be an unending pillar of barbed hooks of wrath and clawing contempt. His deflection of the purple pillar crackling with hooks produces enough sparks that he should logically be gouging trenches into it with his fingers. But it's as endless as he is. Then how do we depart the madness and sever it? Victor asks, as claws shatter against Franklin even as his coat sleeve frays at the edges with him deflecting the pillar. He's being pushed back. However, the Nagasha was only using her hands and arms for that attack and her rattle is unaccounted for. It begins to shake and all the lights in the universe gather to her. Well, this is all an axiom now, right? It's all will and imagination. Those two just have more practice. We can do the same things. The playing field only looks uneven. I scared the fuck out of her with my gunshot and that gave Franklin the opening to do this. Miles says as all light is concentrated into a sword that is caught just barely by the blade with Franklin's left hand as his right deals with the pillar. Then the Nagasha spits poison at his face, only for it to be countered by a roar that erupts into a wave of raw force. More practiced is right. I don't have the head for that kind of madness. Jean-Luc remarks in shock and Beck starts laughing. Not the time, man. No. The perfect time, don't you get it? Beck asks, and everyone looks confused. He points at Franklin who shatters the sword of all light in the universe and plunges everything into darkness. The Nagasha vanishes in response and Franklin looks around for a moment the only light in the skies, then a pair of yellow eyes so massive that he's silhouetted by the light pouring out from one alone. Get what? Sai asks as Franklin charges straight at the eyes and expands to match it. This shocks the Nagasha, even as he slams the top of his head into her face for a brutal headbutt. They're setting the battlefield, but they're too busy fighting each other. So if we can screw with the setting details, we might be able to open either a passage to the prize or shift the kind of fight into something Franklin can outright win 
rather than this unending contest of who can think of bigger. Because those two are basically just multiplying infinity by the biggest numbers they can think of, and we've gone well and truly past the point of stupid. Change the genre? Marcus asks in shock. We're in a reality that's all about how it's perceived, right? Well, we got the numbers, so let's change the story style. They're fighting as gods, as things whose mere presence creates realities. A big contest on who can think of the most stupid thing. But what if that's not the contest? We make this about hand-to-hand -hand combat and Franklin can use her as a jump rope. Ryu realizes. In the background, the Nagasha tries to squeeze down on Franklin with her coils, even as his arms and hands are busy deflecting an unending barrage from her six. However, his coat being made of plasma seems to be much more relevant as she starts to burn. Can he? We don't know anything about this woman beyond the fact that she rigged this ship to send us to her personal wonderland, Lou says before he grins. But if we keep changing the game to find one where Franklin can outright win, we might not only get her killed and finished, but will likely scare out whatever is at the source of the madness is. Behind them, reality seems to shatter as Franklin goes nuclear and detonates with obscene power. The universe is just a white emptiness with the Nagasha as a black silhouette with yellow eyes. Yet Franklin is still there as a brighter point, as the center of the white light that glares down at the being of darkness. He's gone from star titan to light embodied. He just got control. Sai remarks as suddenly Franklin seems infinitely large and stomps onto the Nagasha like one would a slug. She catches his foot and holds it steady. Her rattle methodically shakes as reality starts to crack. Everything is the inside of a white egg with unending darkness pressing down to crush them all. Bullshit he did. We're changing the subject, Miles says before thinking. Now, how do we do this? It's axiom. Will is the way, Beck says as the egg collapses and the light embodied catches the stabbing claws of darkness with his hands and feet to prevent himself from being crushed. Just back me up. I've got an idea. Oh, this ought to be good, Miles says, turning to look right at Beck even as the rest of the group does. Oh? They're making progress, Franklin notes as everything shifts. No longer is he some kind of titan. The rules are strict and clear. The room for nonsense, however, is still exceptional. His linen-wrapped fingers dig into the desert sands and withdraws a massive bull with arrows the size of spears. The harsh, burning winds pull at his linen cloak. It's stained red from the blood of his foes. He is now a hunter along the side of the Nile, and his prey is close. He crests a dune before climbing a small hill that shows the river in the distance. There is the Nagasha, cursing and screaming as she fends off a crocodile. The sheer jarring differences has caused her great panic and confusion. Has she forgotten that she has forged a malleable reality? It matters not. He plants his feet and withdraws one of his enormous arrows. With creaks and groans, the immense bow slowly bends as he applies more tension than any mortal man could ever muster on earth to the ungodly weapon. Or perhaps it is godly. He'll have to look up who the Egyptian god of the hunt is when this is over, because he's clearly playing the part of their champion. He lets the spear-sized arrow fly and it soars through the air with unnatural ease, her scream as it pins her to the ground is nearly musical, and he pulls out a second arrow. In the distance, he can see her spot him, even as he lets fly with the second shot. She burrows into the ground, and he feels the stone under his feet shake and crack. She's adapting. We need another setting, Miles says as Beck curses that the bitch is summoning giant snakes from underground. Obvious in hindsight. Well, since we're going national, focus on Moi. Jean-Luc says, and everyone turns to him. Time for a classic? Three Musketeers, Victor asks, and Jean-Luc scoffs. No, Jean-Luc says, and reality shifts. For just a flicker they spot. Something glowing with axiom. It's gone before anything else can be deciphered. 
Franklin smiles as he snags a glass of wine off a serving man's tray and suppresses a snicker that would give him away. He has no idea where he is, but if he's confused, the snake is going to be unable to even form coherent thoughts. He's dressed in silk and finery with a bright burgundy vest hidden under a navy blue waistcoat and he hasn't looked down enough to check his pants. He doesn't want to break character, no matter how much the absurd ruffle on his neck makes him want to just rip it off. He hates the feelings that clothing like that brings up. A gunshot causes the gentle violin music to crash to a stop before being cut by a scream of terror. Where is he? The Nagasha screams out and Franklin resists rolling his eyes. Clearly, this is not her setting. Now, if he could figure out what the setting is besides something to do with ballrooms, then he'd be a bit more comfortable himself. Franklin checks his own reflection in his wine glass and represses a smirk as he adopts a look of shock and horror. He looks like fop. Perfect. As sir, uh, a letter has arrived for you, Baron Smith, a server says, and Franklin accepts the letter as he glances between the wine glass and the letter, and he quickly drinks down the wine and then hands the glass to the server who nods to him and quickly bustles away. He carefully unfolds the letter and blinks. Like the setting? It's a classic written by Baroness Orksy. This should give you a clean shot on the girl, possibly a kill shot. When you take it, we'll change again. We think we spotted the heart, so we'll need a few more shifts and you'll need to keep her distracted. Godspeed, Baron Martin. I must confess, I've never seen such a language before. A man says from behind Franklin, he's absurdly well-dressed and has very delicate hands that he offers to Franklin with a smile. Franklin shakes his hand and smiles in return. It's a rather foreign trade language, spoken by a large number of rather savage matriarchal tribes. Matriarchal? They espouse women ruling over men. Franklin returns and the man blinks. Well, I suppose my wife does. I what, Percy? A rather annoyed woman asks and the man visibly flinches. There's something overdramatic about it. The man's acting. Oh dear, I believe that I've started something. I do apologize. Pardon me, Franklin says, bustling off. He quickly feels around the inside of his coat to find a pistol and smiles. He quickly slips up behind the Nagasha to find that she's a woman in a serpent-themed dress struggling to keep balanced and lashing out with knives, even as her four excess arms are attempting to burst forth from the sides. She's clearly trying to get her form familiar again and is very distracted. In a single moment, Franklin draws his pistol and fires it right between the eyes. She shifts and hops with unnatural speeds and catches the bullet in her teeth. Well, shit. Reality reshuffles once more and he's looking out from under a helmet with a mask on it to a monochrome world. A quick glance at those around him confirms that he's surrounded by samurai. A scream of fury fills the air before he can gather his thoughts. What was that? He asks, and his words come out in Japanese with tiny white subtitles at the bottom of his vision. Someone's clearly having fun with this one. The Nagasha bursts out of the woods with an unholy scream, looking like a cross between a mad scientist's unholy experiment and a demon. Those around him scream yokai in terror and several break and run. Franklin draws his sword and charges. Slay the beast, he screams as he dodges a spit of burning blood, the only color in the otherwise black and white world, and slices into one of her hands. Then he's suddenly sitting at a bar. The shifts are getting faster. If they have spotted something, then they're clearly homing in on it and he needs to keep her attention all the more. What am I in now? He asks himself and sees the subtitles again. He's fairly certain he just spoke Chinese. A wire foo movie? It would fit all the Asian looking faces. Of course he stands out like a flare as he looks into the drink in his hand. He's wearing a red cape over top armor with a sword to his side. Naga! There is a Naga seeking blood! A man screams running into the bar in terror. Franklin rises up and hurries out. 
Sure enough, she's out there attacking people at random now. Clearly, she's distracted and losing patience. Franklin draws his Gian and tosses it into the air before jumping up, spinning and delivering a kick to the pummel of the weapon that sends it flying into her back like a spear. Reality shifts once more. Just a few more. Miles whispers and Franklin nods, even as things reform. He spurs his horse onwards to try and keep pace with the train. Whatever's going on the train's important. Maybe he has to hijack it. He stands up in the saddle as the horse starts to lag and then jumps the last few feet to grab onto the railing of the caboose. The sheer twisting winds blow his hat off and he mentally curses even as his kerchief, bright red, slaps him in his face. All right, you varmint. Let's see how well you do a six-shooter jig. Franklin says out loud and grins at how stupid it sounds. He finds the door locked and then shoulders it open with a growl. The Nagasha turns to him in shock, still half woman and half snake, but her extra arms are gone. Reach for the sky. What are you even doing? She demands before he shoots and reality shifts again. Franklin is now in a three-piece suit and clearly feels the pieces of a Tommy gun broken down in his jacket. Hey, 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 Frankie, my man. Lot going on tonight, Jake says as the bartender as he passes Franklin a drink. You guys are doing a banger of a job. Where is she this time? Franklin asks, staying in character. The whiskey is a harsh burn on his throat, but a welcome one that focuses him, if it's even real. We need you to stretch this one out. We managed to get path to the prize open and we need her looking for you. So that was the last change. Think you can do things as Frankie Fibs? Frankie Fibs? Probably not, flirty Frankie. Maybe, Franklin says, and Jake snorts in amusement. If all else fails, we're switching to a sports movie, so be ready to tackle someone. I've not played much football. Franklin admits, and Jake shrugs before leaning in. We were able to make the core a prize and in play in this unreality, so we got the boys doing a bank heist as you keep her busy. If that fails, then the next shift will make it the trophy for the finals game. Real easy. And where will she be in that game? Or for that matter, where is she now? She's in the club now, Jake says, pointing down to the next room where the music is coming from. She'll be a cheerleader trying to figure out which way is up in the next one. Just keep her eyes on you and we should be able to pull this off. All right, I'll get to it. And don't let Jean-Luc have too much fun with the dynamite. Too late, my brother. Too late, Jake says. And Franklin chuckles. Right. Well, I'll get to it. Although, thank you for not doing this with magical girls. I really don't think I could have pulled of a miniskirt. Franklin jokes and Jake snorts so hard he nearly doubles over. There were some genres off limits. Any with high technology or blatant magic was a no-go, so magical girls, maka, fantasy, and sci-fi were off the list. Never been happier to be denied my favorite entertainment, Franklin says and Jake grins. Magical girls? Hey, some are pretty darn good. Franklin volleys back and gets a chuckle. Anyways, I'll keep her busy. You just bust open that vault, all right? We're on in it, Frankie man. We're on it, Jake assures him, and Franklin nods before throwing back the whiskey. Good luck scoring it. I'm going to need it. The woman's a snake, he says and gets a he of amusement as he turns and leaves for the dance room. He spots her easily enough and catches her as she stumbles. May I have this dance? he asks, and she gasps at the sight of his face. What is going on? How are you doing this? She asks, as he takes in the fact that, while she looks human, possibly Arabic, she still has her yellow eyes and her true form is in a tattoo coiled around her arm. Beyond that, she's in a shimmering black cocktail dress and struggling to stay upright in high heels. The opera gloves go up to her elbows and she has a feathery boa to complete the look. Magic, he says with a grin. To be particular, the oldest of human magics, misdirection. Not that he's going to tell her that. But I... I can't feel the axiom. 
I change the settings to filter it out bit by bit. We are now deep in null, no axiom to be found. Franklin smoothly lies as he wonders if she noticed that the place with the fancy costumes where he shot her with the flintlock was utterly non-magical as well. Maybe, maybe not. Who are you? You're one of those humans, only they would know what a null-drenched hellsape is like enough to remake one, she asks in shock. Indeed, though, I must confess I have a few questions of my own, Franklin says, leading her around to stand near the band. Hey, gents, mind a slower song next? The lady's on some delicate ankles. The music slows as he requested, and he leads the confused Nagasha further onto the dance floor. So... You have questions? Mostly the whys of it. You're clearly a smart woman, a woman of means and skills. Why do something as base and cruel as slave trading to make money? I sense the kutha in your ship. You are rolling in credits. Yes, all of them from selling idiots to have better purpose. If any of them were worth the freedom I take from them, then they'd break out. It's that simple. A life is just another product a natural resource to be exploited. Those that claw out to freedom can have it. They've earned it. Those that haven't don't deserve it. Otherwise, they just waste their lives without purpose or cause. Really, it's a service to slave and slave owner, both. The slave gets purpose, the owner gets a slave. Nice and simple. You say it like it's simple, but there are many matters to consider, Franklin remarks as he slowly guides her into a slow dance. Oh. Like what? Like the fact that your tune would change in an instant if you were under the whip hand. It's convenient to argue for dominance of the strong when you're in a position of power, but following through when you're not is a fair bit harder. Oh, you think I'm helpless now, that I can't do anything without axiom. I think you struggle to stand upright. I can feel you pressing a huge amount of your weight on my shoulder to keep yourself upright. If you even start to move around with any speed, you'll only break your ankles in those shoes, Franklin says gently. And what do you think about this? She asks, pressing a tiny gun into his stomach. Do it. He dares her, and she blinks. What? Do it! He then leans in as his grip tightens to painful levels. Do you still feel like you're in control? His hand reaches around and grabs the back of her neck with a vice-like grip and her eyes go wide with fear. Do you still feel like you're in control? He asks again and she starts to shake. The unreality crashes and suddenly Franklin is face to face to an augmented Nagasha woman and he quickly runs a knockout effect through her. She slumps in his arms and he pulls out one of his disruption needles and stretches it into a thin band that he infuses with the sleeping effect and wraps around her forehead. Franklin here. The witch is out cold. I repeat, the witch is out cold. He reports into his communicator and can hear some cheering from the rest of the guys. Good. Stay with her and make sure she stays alive. We've got hundreds of clones down here, all of them in varying stages of development, but only ten of them are too young to inhabit. Make sure she can't run into a new body. That is your first priority soldier. Miles reports and Franklin's eyes go wide at the implications. Sir, yes sir, he says before looking down at the woman who's even more dangerous than he thought. 